topic organized here in Bruegel, a very important issue, as, uh, as you've seen also from the number of, of, of publications that we have and the number of events that we have on NPLs. Today we have something very specific on NPLs, a, a, a European Economy, Banks Regulation and the Real Sector Journal. The chief editor and the editor are with us today. They have a special issue on the issue, on, on the issue of NPLs. Um, and they're here to tell us the uh, results of, of, of their uh, research, followed by uh, a very prestigious panel on the, uh, uh, towards the edges of the table. We have four people that are going to give us their views on what will we have said before that. Um, and before I give the, uh, the, the word to, to Giorgio to introduce us to the issue, I would like to give you, for the benefits of our audience, I'd like to give you, um, if I can possibly ask for the slides to be put up, I'd like to give you um, uh, just three pictures in order to illustrate the scale of the problem we're talking about, progress that has been made and has not been made, and why we're really spending so much effort to, uh, to on, on the issue of NPLs. Uh, and I would like to put it to you that the issue of NPLs is not just a banking problem, is a, is a much bigger problem that actually is keeping Europe from from growing at, at levels of, of, uh, of growth that are sustainable. Um, so this is a graph that uh, you will have seen um, extensively. Um, and up till about 2014, uh, it was a graph that we were using to tell the story about the difference between progress in NPLs in the Euro area and uh, in the US. So I have three countries here, the Euro area, United Kingdom and in the US, and really you have seen uh, while in the crisis years there has been great correlation, co-movement in the way that NPLs increased both in levels and in, uh, in directions of speed. Uh, after that, there was a huge divergence with the U.S. really making progress in sort of returning back to, um, uh, to, to if I may say, in the good direction, reducing the APLs, whereas uh, in, the Euro, in the Euro area that was not the case. That is no longer true since 2014. We, we, we've now seen uh, much uh, progress uh, done on this, on this front, which is both welcome uh, but should not be stopped. Uh, because there is huge differences between countries in the Euro area and in the EU more, more, uh, uh, more extensively. Uh, there are countries with very big um, uh, numbers of NPLs on the balance sheets, uh, to the order of 40 and 45 percent of the total balance sheet, which is actually, it's actually very big on the number of loans. Uh, so you see here both uh, the levels currently uh, and progress made, or, or not, as the case may be, and the red dot again is, is, um, is the U.S. So this is actually what we will be talking about, the divergences uh, in between countries. Also, we will hear about the divergences between banks. Uh, but one last thing I would like to, uh, to put in the conversation, and I'm hoping that we can pick it up later on, is that why this is an important resolving NPLs is an important issue um, for the health of the, of the bank's balance sheet. It's not the whole story. Uh, we need to look broader than that. We need to look at the indebtedness of, of countries, and in particular, I would like to need the private levels of debt uh, in uh, the EU, the Eurozone, and specifically in the countries. The blue bars represent uh, the levels of private debts. The dark side, the dark part of the bar is in the level of 2000. The lighter bar is where we got to uh, at the peak of indebtedness. And, and please look at the scale on the left-hand side. So this is in terms of GDP. You can see that the numbers are really quite big. And then the blue dot is really the progress made and where we are right now. And you can see that not, not much progress has been made in terms of reducing those debts. Now, I always, when I, when I present these graphs, I always put also the fiscal debt on this, on this graph, which is the yellow diamond, just to show that actually the real problem of indebtedness in the euro area and in the EU is not so much the fiscal debts, with important exceptions, but it's really the private debts. Um, and, you know, resolving those debts is, is uh, both an urgent problem and one that needs to be done not just with one tool, but with multiple tools, and we are here to discuss uh, some of them. So with that, I'm going to pass on to uh, Giorgio, who is going to introduce us to the, uh, to the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. I will be very brief because uh, Giacomo Calzolare, who is uh, another editor of the journal, will present the results. Uh, Giacomo is the editor with uh, Alberto Pozzolo, who is sitting there. We are a triumvirate. How do you say triumvirate? And uh, so I don't want to take full responsibility of the outcome. And Jose Mancilia also, who is sitting there, is our junior editor. So maybe we will, if things go wrong, it's all his fault. 
<laughs> will be totally unfair. And also, I have, uh, I want to mention also Unicredit, who is uh, the sponsor of this uh, journal, who's been sponsoring this journal for many years. <clears throat> so, Maria, thank you very much for hosting us. We like to celebrate our birthday at Bruegel, and we do it every year. This year, we are one day late, because usually it's the 5th of July. Ah. So, we, we launched the first issue of European Economy here. Downstairs, this room was not ready yet, uh, and then every year now, the fifth or the sixth of July, we have our this issue. We are presenting it here, and it's always a pleasure to be here in Bruegel. And uh, I want to thank you and also Guntram for hosting us, and also Giuseppe Porcaro who has supervised the organization of this event. Now, this issue of uh, our journal, we publish two issues a year, is on non-performing loans. And uh, essentially, I would say it's even more focused than on performing loans, is on uh, state-backed asset management companies um, uh, that deal, that can deal with uh, non-performing loans. So even though, of course, we know that there are many other options and many other ways and many other tools to deal with non-performing loans, and Giacomo will be discussing those, here we decided to focus on one specific issue to be more focused. And the reason why we did that is that we felt that on the table there are many proposals, both from uh, institutions and uh, academics, and uh, we, so we decided that it was maybe a good idea to have a whole number of the journal which was presenting all these proposals and trying to understand uh, what points there were in common. And actually, we realized that the gaps to be bridged between the different proposals are not so big. So uh, it's possible to essentially uh, generate, if you want, even a meta proposal or from all these proposals that could be a working first step uh, for a good blueprint for a European non-performing loans, however designed and constructed. So that's why we, we, we decided to this number of non-performing loans. I think there are interest, very interesting issues. We got contributions uh, from, very, from institutions and academics and very prominent academics, and I want to thank them all uh, for having done this with us. And, uh, but I think that uh, Giacomo will be presenting all the details of what we find out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Giorgio. Uh, if we can put our slides on. Um, thank you. Okay, so here we are. Um, so let me just uh, uh, say a few words on, uh, on the journal. Uh, that was going to be very brief. Uh, so European Economy, uh, it's a journal, uh, it's a platform that uh, deals with the uh, bank's regulation and the real connection with the real sector. Um, so we are, uh, the issues, uh, the issue of, we are talking about it's uh, non-performing loans is going to be out uh, uh, today. Uh, so this is the content of the issue, uh, which of course uh, we encourage uh, to uh, read uh, carefully. Um, so the typical structure of uh, our uh, journal is, uh, uh, is the following. We have a, uh, some material from the uh, editorial desk. Uh, so we have a uh, general comments that uh, uh, me, Giorgio, and Alberto we prepare regularly. We have numbers. Uh, we have a few uh, comments on institutions that are relevant for the topic at hand, uh, and then we have a literature uh, literature review for key readings. And then you know, for this time, this particular occasion, we have this set of proposals that we'll comment on. And, uh, and in particular, uh, given this set of proposal, we will have a, we have a discussion uh, from uh, um, uh, distinguished uh, um, academics. So, um, so let me just skip uh, this to mention that we are uh, regularly publishing uh, twice a year. On uh, you see, the last issue was uh, on bank resolution and the mutualization of risk and sovereign bank risk uh, and policies, related policies, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's go back to uh, the issue of uh, today. Um, so in the end, uh, probably the, the important question is uh, where are we now and what we, why do we care about uh, non-performing loans? So let me just mention that uh, uh, it's a widespread uh, phenomenon for European countries. Uh, 
probably the largest concentration of NPLs is uh, in Italy and Greece, but I'll say a few words on, on data. Uh, and in particular, the fact that, as we already seen, there is a massive difference across countries. Um, and, uh, and there is also a significant difference within countries across banks. So we think this is an important dimension of, of, the, of the topic at end. So why do we care? Because uh, large amounts of non-performing loans are uh, is generating intrinsically a risk of financial instability. Uh, it's uh, limiting, uh, constraining the um, uh, capacity to lend and, and growth as a consequence. Um, so we think it's, uh, it's a European-wide issue, and uh, as a consequence, uh, we think a, a European coordinated action is actually necessary. Um, so let me uh, show you, again, a few data. This is about uh, dis distribution across countries. Uh, so in the cake that you, you see, uh, there are really large differences across countries. Um, uh, again, you see large majority uh, in Italy and Greece. Um, and you also see a time trend which is quite uh, clear in, in how different countries are uh, dealing uh, for, with the crisis and after the crisis, of course. Um, but if you also look at uh, banks uh, within countries, again, you see uh, very much uh, variety here. So let me just explain this uh, graph. So the two extremes of the uh, lines that you see here are the uh, minimum and the maximum observed of the NPL ratio uh, in single banks, uh, meaning the amount of NPL over uh, total loans. Uh, and the, um, the X that you see in the bar is uh, the mean uh, for the country, and the box is telling you where the uh, plus 25% and minus 25% uh, uh, to the median uh, stands. So you see that the really variety it's, it's can be huge, within countries, and uh, as said, this uh, we think it's an important dimension of the phenomenon uh, which uh, will have to be addressed. So, um, so then what do we need to do? Um, we think it's an urgent matter and uh, some time has been wasted. Um, so, we think it's important not only because of the current status, it's also because it's also be important because of the future. So we have to set up a, an environment that limits the uh, um, uh, recreation of similar situation in the future. So um, there is a clear comprehensive approach that can be uh, used here. Um, let me just mention a few uh, points that we think are important. Medium term uh, um, horizon, uh, there is a need of uh, supervision to, as I said, prevent the reemergence of excessive uh, levels of non-performing loans. And there are some tools to deal uh, with this that can be um, uh, uh, considered. Um, there, is a, there is a need of reform for the frameworks of uh, restructuring uh, and insolvency and debt recovery. Again, this is a, uh, something that can be managed, we think, in the medium term. Uh, but then there are also um, uh, two other dimensions that are more, if you want, a short-term perspective, but uh, of course still very important to be addressed. Um, first, the need uh, to restructure uh, banks that are loaded with non-performing loans, um, and in there are, again, in this area, there, is a, there are many tools that can be used uh, in order to remove the uh, impediments of uh, uh, addressing within a single bank this, uh, this issue. Again, on the short term, uh, the necessity to develop a secondary market where markets where no performing loans can be uh, traded. And related to this, uh, the importance of developing a uh, national or, and this, there is uh, some debate on this, European asset management companies that can deal with uh, um, 
non-performing loans. Now, the issue, uh, the issue of European economy is, um, as I said, is based on uh, um, proposals. Uh, these proposals come from uh, uh, institutions. Uh, we have a ACB proposal. We have a, a ABA proposal as well. And uh, we have also some comments about uh, the issue with some ideas, uh, very important and interesting ideas by IMF. And then we have, as I said, um, uh, some academics who are commenting on, on these, uh, on these uh, proposals. Um, so um, we know that by this time, uh, the um, Council of European Union is establishing, uh, uh, it's working on, on, the, on the idea of uh, having a European blueprint for um, asset management companies, which we think it's a key, it's a cornerstone in the solution of the, of the problem. So they are mentioning some uh, important uh, uh, dimensions. Um, let me just go through uh, these points. So it's important to determine the uh, appropriate classes of assets that can be uh, acquired by asset management companies. Uh, there is the issue of identifying which banks can uh, uh, offload those uh, non-performing loans. There is an issue of, issue of size, minimum size of uh, uh, non-performing loans that can be transferred outside banks. Uh, there is an issue of asset evaluation, which uh, I'll spend a few words uh, in a moment, which is related to uh, the uh, problem of uh, uh, state aid. And there is an issue of governance of this uh, AMC. Uh, so uh, what we do in the number is we are taking uh, the, these, the views uh, underlying these different proposals uh, we are studying, we studied them in details, and um, if you want, uh, what we do in the number can be summarized by this table. I don't want you to read through the table, but I just want to mention that uh, the idea is that we can compare the current proposals, and uh, it turns out that the proposals are different, but they contain very important and similar uh, elements on which we want to focus. So. They all agree that the problem is a problem of market failure, uh, mainly related to asymmetric information. Uh, it's a problem of bargaining power between buyers and sellers, and can be a problem of forcing banks uh, to uh, dispose too quickly, uh, given the current status of market prices of uh, non-performing loans. They all agree that some public funding is required in this activity. Uh, they all agree that there is a matter of large scale of AMCs. So uh, this relates to, uh, for example, whether we want to have uh, this AMC working at the national level, at the country level, or at the European level. They all agree the proposals that there must be some skin in the game, so uh, uh, banks in order also to avoid moral hazard issues must be um, affected uh, by the transfer of MPLs to AMCs, um, there must be an attention to, preferent, uh, to preserve financial stability. We know that there are uh, banks that may have uh, troubles to re uh, recapitalize in these periods and uh, um, the, the size of the losses that will uh, come out of this uh, transfer it's, uh, uh, can be problematic. And, and also we know that there is a, an issue of uh, uh, the so-called di uh, diabolic loop between uh, sovereign debt and uh, uh, bank's debt. Um, so they all agree the proposals that we have investigated on these points, but there are still some differences, relevant differences. And there are open issues. So I just want to mention three that we think are uh, important and still to um, consensus must be, still be built on these uh, three important points. Um, there is an issue of mutualization of risk, uh, which of course it's very delicate topic at the uh, European level. Uh, mutualization of risk uh, 
for the potential cost that these uh, uh, AMC, these asset management companies may face in the end. Um, and we cannot forget that the uh, uh, link with the uh, uh, sovereign debt is there for some countries in Europe, and that is cannot be simply forgot. It's there, and we have to explicitly address this issue. Um, there is a problem of identifying which banks, as I said, can be allowed to transfer uh, MPLs to uh, uh, AMCs. Um, and from this point of view, there is a, um, the so-called state aid envelope, which somehow is generating a limit uh, for uh, those, the identification of those banks that can uh, uh, offload MPLs. And the idea is that um, could be that banks with no capital shortage, according to stress tests or asset equality evaluations, uh, reviews, uh, cannot be allowed to uh, uh, offload uh, MPLs. We think that a large portion of NPLs is also in the hands of these banks, and we think that market failures is affecting uh, uh, independently of this uh, type of um, issues, which are important, but uh, we think are somehow um, aside. And the third point is uh, there is an issue which is quite uh, complicated of determining the transfer price from uh, banks to uh, AMCs, especially for those non-performing loans that can be named non-standard. So, for example, uh, related to loans of, uh, to small medium enterprises, which are not backed by real estate, for example. Um, so what's the right price, transfer price in this case is diff very difficult to identify. Um, there are some approaches, and we here suggest that uh, probably uh, there are some other experience of uh, a similar issue in identifying transfer prices that could be, in principle, uh, quite useful benchmark, or are at least quite useful to, and to uh, find ideas. I'm just, for example, mentioning to uh, the issue of transfer pricing for fiscal purposes, which is, of course, a completely different thing, but uh, there has been a very long debate that uh, uh, generated some quite, uh, quite interesting ideas and which could be addressed uh, also for MPLs. And uh, that was really what I wanted to tell you, and I don't want to uh, waste your time because we have this wonderful uh, panel here, and so, uh, here I am. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Giacomo. That was very useful. Lots to think about. I mean, particularly the last, your last point on the transfer pricing. It's very difficult to think about uh, ways of thinking about the issue if, you, if you're operating in an environment where there isn't really an explicit market for this. So I think one of the issues, and, and here I hope the panel will, 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 uh, will give us their views, the issue of thinking about developing secondary markets for these types of issues is one way of, of moving away from what is the right transfer price and let the markets talk. But let me, let me stop here, and I would like then to sort of invite our panelists to, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to give us their views on the proposals or, or country experiences or other things which you think are important in the context of EU architecture. Uh, let me first introduce you to, to our panelists. On, on my right, I have Emilio Savoules, who is a, um, a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we have, I'm following the order on the program, and I would like to stick to that if I may. Uh, Professor Helwig, Martin Helwig from uh, Max Planck Institute of Research. Um, we have Helen Lurie, who is a professor uh, at the Department of Economics uh, at the Athens University of Economics and Business, and the deputy, previously deputy governor of the Bank of Greece. And, and least, last but not least, uh, on my left, uh, Laura von Daniels, who is an associate at the German Institute for International Security Affairs. In, um, I would like to invite you to give us your thoughts maybe in 10 minutes. We'll take turns, and then I would like to uh, have reactions from, the, uh, from both of you, and then we'll open the floor to a discussion. So, Emilius, if I can uh, yes. ask you to take the floor. You have slides? Yes. 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 So, can I pass you this? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation, and uh, very many thanks to Giorgio for pushing and incentivizing me to think about it. Uh, Charles, apologies, he is caught up at a gig at the Bank of England, so he couldn't attend. All complaints can be directed to me. Um, what we have done is um, we took on board uh, 
criticism on an earlier paper that was published in December 2016 in the same journal that our proposal for a pan-European bad bank was not, um, was not uh, specific enough. And of course, we took uh, heart from the fact that um, Andrea Enria's proposal tracked um, very closely our earlier proposal. So what we are doing in this paper is providing flesh to earlier ideas and answering all the criticism. So first of all, I would like to give you a helicopter view of what uh, uh, am I? Okay. What are the problems with asset management companies? And of course, the first problem is distribution, um, meaning valuation, e, uh, at which price do you transfer the non-performing assets? If it is net book value, then the asset management company loses disproportionately. If it's market value, probably the bank will go into resolution. And resolution in Europe is no longer a simple thing because of the draconian bail-in provisions. The other thing, of course, is transparency and the fact that in many cases and many jurisdictions, you're going to have a market for lemons uh, situation. Then if the AMC is particularly generous with pricing, you have moral hazard. And of course, there is governance, which is a very important issue, and we shouldn't hide behind our finger. Um, governance of European banking is a very important issue, especially in the periphery, and lots of parties in Greece or Cyprus would love to have an AMC to warehouse bad credits of connected parties or provide the lifeline zombie companies. As a matter of fact, it's exactly what the PRC asset restructuring scheme is doing right now based on an EMC, PRC meaning the People's Republic of China. I had the uh, directors of the State Council in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, and um, they told me that I'm a revolutionary, perhaps not as revolutionary as Chairman Mao. Um, next, oops. Now, the advantages, and our proposal has focused on corporate NPLs, so we'll talk about the advantages of transferring corporate credits. Um, AMCs, asset management companies, or bad banks as they are called, they have a sound track record. Uh, earlier use in Scandinavia, Asia, the Asia banking crisis, and to some extent Ireland, uh, have been successful. All the relevant experiments have been uh, successful. Now, whether it was uh, amortized and inflate, or it was a genuine success story, nobody can tell us uh, for sure. But on the other hand, it's better than pretended extent. It's a clean cut solution because you, uh, you have a ceiling as to how much the bank might lose. Provides certainty to uh, investors who want to invest in the banks, a major issue with European banking. Lending, lending uh, credit provision resumes, the debt overhang resets. Uh, as you've heard from Giacomo, that's a very major problem for GDP growth in the periphery of the Eurozone. And uh, a liquidity drought is specifically affecting the people who will bring growth, which is the small and medium enterprises. Now, having a central focal point to uh, work out non-performing loans, that's corporate credits, uh, provides economies of scale if you want to hire, work out, or private equity skills. And it's a single point of decision making, which is very important, as I will explain in the next slide, because if we have lots of banks involved in the restructuring, we have multiple uh, equilibria or disequilibria. Now, uh, obviously, being a radical solution frees up very considerable management time, I'm sure you all understand that most of the management time in Italy or Greece is, uh, is dedicated to NPL management, NPL resolution, rather than managing the bank or the people in the bank or new lending. And of course, if you want to create a, a liquid market for distressed assets, um, for distressed debt, that's the best way to do that because you will have a, a economies of scale, a focal point for debt marketing and issuance. Now, in the Eurozone in specific, uh, the NPLs, as you heard, act as a drug to Eurozone recovery. 
bail-ins, as we argued with Charles in 2015, are a good thing. They battle moral hazard if the failure is idiosyncratic, if the failure is systemic, bail-in can turn into the nuclear option, inducing a credit of flight. And funding problems uh, post-resolution, it's a mistake to think that uh, the bank is uh, <coughs> resolved, is recapitalized, the creditors and the shareholders will um, flock to the door in order to invest in the resolved bank. There are serious confidence and behavioral issues. Um, and behavioral issues uh, with bail-in ex ante can, um, can uh, uh, spill over to the behavior of the regulators and, of course, the management. As far as I'm concerned, the, Greek, um, the management of the Greek banks, for instance, are doomed if they act on the NPLs and doomed if they do not. If they act, they will need to recapitalize new uh, investors, means new management. If they do not act, they will lose their jobs because the banks will not pass the stress test in 2018. So what do you do? Now, a sensible a, a asset management structure would that credibility to the BRD's draconian bailing provisions. Otherwise, you have Italian-type bank rescues. Um, and uh, if you have many of those, then the exemption can easily become the rule. Now, um, other advantages of having a, an AMC for corporate NPLs in the Eurozone is to lower, it lowers the cost of funding for banks, obviously, since you restore confidence um, uh, in Cypriot or Greek banks, um, deposits might return and they are much cheaper than funding from, uh, from ELA. Um, is this the burden on the ECB on buying the junk that is currently buying? Of course, it's AAA. Uh, and um, above all, provides better coordination of restructuring of multiple claims because you ha when you have lots of banks involved in the restructuring uh, and if you have big corporate creditors and these are the NPLs that matter, you're going to have lots of, um, if you have big corporate borrowers, you're going to have lots of creditors, not to waste about it. And you have, in that context, you have multiple equilibria or disequilibria and multiple prisoners dilemma is uh, dilemmas. It's much better uh, to eliminate conflicting incentives and have a focal point of decision making. Now, obstacles in having um, AMCs in Europe, whether it's a centralized structure, a category-based uh, structure, are uh, numerous. For a centralized structure, you are facing asymmetrical legal uh, regimes, impacting on recovery rates and timeline of recovery, of course. Um, oh, sorry. I'm a few slides behind. Eh? Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, asymmetrical governance and transparency standards, um, uh, even though, for instance, in, um, in Greece or Cyprus or in other places, the institutions have cleared up uh, bank management, still um, the old relationships exist, so can you trust bank management or the AMC management to do their job properly? Severe market for lemon situations in some cases, uh, and these are the West hit uh, jurisdictions. And then in here, uh, inherent and existential fear of fiscal burden sharing and debt mutualization in the Eurozone. Um, this is more existential rather than um, um, that's an existential fear of the Eurozone where, of course, the fallen should pay for their failure rather than um, an actual treaty prohibition. And of course, there are the state aid rules of the 2013 banking communication uh, of the Commission and the Cotton case, which mandate burden sharing before any kind of state aid is offered. And um, that mostly means shareholders, but it remains unclear whether the Commission would uh, approve a state aid package where subordinate creditors have not taken the debt or not, have not taken a hit or not. And that's, of course, if the bank is uh, going concerned. Otherwise, you go to the BRD and Berlin. So is there a solution that could resolve the impasse? And here is our proposal. We propose something like a holding company structure or a centralized agency-based scheme, as Helen Lurie uh, mentioned in um, her superb comment on the paper. Now, um, what we suggest? 
We suggest a, a centralization of decision making, transparency requirements, and marketing through an, a, a Eurozone holding company that's held jointly by affected member states or an agency, but we prefer a holding company rather than going through the vagaries of EU constitutional law. Um, centralization of decision making, transparency, and marketing will aid the comparability of recovery and the effect, comparability of effectiveness of, recover, of country recovery regimes, because we say we have harmonized or structured the legal regimes, but only in practice. If we have comparable figures, we can see who's the laggard and who's doing well. Um, we shouldn't forget uh, technology and fintech. A centralized agency or a holding company, as we suggest, can establish, uh, can establish debt platforms. Uh, where people can trade uh, centrally on distressed debts. Um, he, and also we, um, we suggest a move towards objectiv objectivization of valuation, meaning uh, the, the valuation of um, uh, the key variable that we offer here because we, we suggest that uh, the price, the transfer price should be a combination of uh, three variables, the net book value, that's book value X provisions, the market value and the long-term economic value. The third, we suggest that should be found by the European Investment Bank so that we have an objective uh, um, balancing variable. Um, as to the market value where, uh, where possible, we suggest real-life auctions so that we have real bids uh, rather than a LIBOR type of, uh, of situation. And obviously, all that will give us a very clear cut and transparent distribution of losses. Uh, on the other hand, because that's a holding company structure with ring fenced or quasi ring fenced subsidiaries owned by the sorry, uh, owned by the member state banks, so it's going to be a scheme where um, where shareholding is um, held uh, by uh, the private banks. We have a decentralization, and of course, we'll issue uh, the, uh, each asset management company its uh, country based subsidiary. We'll issue asset back debt. Uh, we are going to have um, decentralization of losses. Um, as you will see later, we talk about an ESM guarantee, but that's no permanent transfer, and no mutualization. It's predominantly it's predominantly a private scheme at the member state level, bank-owned scheme fu funded by the shareholders' equity and asset-backed uh, scheme. If there are residual losses, the ultimate guarantor will be the ESM uh, under the precautionary recapitalization facility uh, in the form of the guarantee. For the time being, the ESM does not give a guarantee. If we went to an English QC to give us to give us a legal opinion as to what is a loan, he would say that it's an instant disbursement of uh, funds or a contingent disbursement of funds. That's exactly what the guarantee is. So whether, uh, whether that needs a change in the ESM statute or just an interpretation by the ESM board, uh, I'm not sure. If there is any temporary transfer via the ESM, that's legal uh, under the European Court of Justice's ruling in Pringle. Now, claw back only for the worst offenders, that's, that is banks whose NPLs have, uh, have fetched a much, lower, a much lower market value than the rest of the, uh, than the average of the sector. Structural conditionality should be a possibility. Burden sharing is ingrained in the scheme. Bank shareholders lose money through the participation in the share capital of the AMC, which will be a significant participation compared, of course, with the, um, with the uh, volume of non-performing loans that they will be transferring. And you can ask banks to raise new equity. That's definitely better than sharing because you dilute um, existing shareholders to extinction. Now, um, how about subordinated creditors? Both the uh, Courtney case and the, uh, co the communication are unclear especially the Kotnik case. So um, do you need to, um, the court in the Kotnik case said that um, it might still be legally uh, state aid, but doesn't automatically qualify as, uh, as legal state aid. The commission will make an ad hoc uh, decision. So even if you spare subordinated uh, creditors, and if you assume, as you should, 
that the NSM guarantee absorbing um, residual losses is state aid, then either the Commission will have to issue an opinion whether subordinate creditors should always be hit. Uh, it's unclear in, what the, in the court's uh, jurisprudence and the communication or COCO, communica or COCO documentation should be changed through collective action clauses in order for the COCO holders to take the hit and uh, satisfy the requirement, if there is a mandatory requirement. It's extremely clear to me if there is such a requirement right now. And uh, uh, naturally, it presents no fundamental discrepancies with ENRIA and other plans. If you, read the, if you read the paper, the numbers are much more specific than I can do in 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of discussion on the centralization of the AMC. I think this is a very important dimension. You discussed the, the benefits, the obstacles and advantages of AMCs. Another dimension is whether that should be centralized or should be at the country level. I'm, I'm sure we will have views on this and I look forward to that. But before that, um, let me turn to Martin for, for his comments on, on this. Martin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I'd like to express some skepticism. Uh, I'm concerned about some of the underlying politics, I'm concerned about the technicalities, and I'm skeptical about whether uh, the efficiencies are really all that large. At the first ECB forum in Sintra, Adam Posen made the comment, to get out of the crisis, force banks to raise a lot of equity. And I said, well, if the problem is uh, that we have over-indebtedness not only of banks but also of households, firms, and governments, how does that help? And his response was, well, if the banks are sufficiently capitalized, they can deal with the problems on their own. The reason why they don't deal with the problem of non-performing loans on their own is because they feel their equity is too low to withstand uh, those losses. So the standard argument is uh, against that would be they cannot raise the equity. Of course, they never want to do that, but the question is, can they? One answer to that is, well, if they were known to be solvent, they could always raise the equity. So a critical question is, are they solvent or are they not solvent? And if they are solvent, we should find mechanisms to force them to raise the equity. After all, the dilution of incumbent shareholders that would be involved would basically be the devaluation of the default option. And you can ask, what's the constitutional value of the property right of the option to not fulfill contractual obligations? Uh, unwilling, well, you need to force them. That's what we have resolution for. So one part of the story that we're talking about is a story, why do we not use resolution? And if we talk about uh, carve-outs without resolution, on what contractual basis? Do they have to agree? That would have an influence on the pricing. Is, would all this be voluntary or not? Can such carve-outs help? The answer is yes and no. It's yes if there are sufficient subsidies. It's no without the subsidies. Uh, and in addition, there may be systemic risk from excessive bailouts, basically uh, because the underlying problem of bank profitability in a situation where we have overbanking is not going to be resolved if we maintain all these institutions in existence. Now, carve-outs have been uniquely successful in cases with enormous public sub subsidies like Hoopo Real Estate, where basically the German government uh, instituted a bad bank, uh, the commission estimated that the state aid was on the order of 16 billion. The reprivatization of the good part brought some uh, 2 billion, uh, very costly for the taxpayer. 
if bail-ins are seen as the problem, then we should declare that this is a program for having the taxpayer absorb losses. Now, in the ENRIA proposal, there is a discussion of clawbacks. I think clawbacks are a combination of make-believe and dangerous. Basically, you provide the government with something like a sub very subordinated debt, which only becomes due if the bank earns profits before that. But it's still prior to equity. And all the moral hazard problems that we have from debt overhang will be attached to that. So while the accountants and the regulators may say this is not debt, in terms of the economics of the problem, it is. And therefore, I think we should not fool ourselves about uh, the ability to shift uh, the, the, the burden of the subsidies back to the banks. Basically, that would just exchange the asset risk, risk from the assets, uh, into a risk from contingent debt and would be uh, very um, problematic. On that point, if it's a question of who's going to bear the risk, I applaud the suggestion uh, that was made uh, just before about trying to do this at the level of the ESM, uh, but then also put a lot of other stuff at the level of the EF ESM. Politically, part of the story about the Italian banks is not just about bail-in of various types of creditors, but it's also who's in control, Italian institutions or European institutions. At one moment, the banks are too systemically important for them to be resolved. And then when the state aid procedure doesn't lead anywhere, they are too systemically unimportant for them to be resolved. The common theme in both statements, and the only thing that provides them with substantive consistency is we don't want Brussels, the SRB, to be taking care of these banks. So to the extent uh, that the uh, proposal we just heard uh, deals at, addresses that, uh, I very much applaud that. By the way, the subsidies must be sufficient. The counterexample to Hupo real estate is HSH Notebook, where the asset carve-out uh, carve is so small that the solvency problem is not going to be resolved, and I expect we're going to hear more of that uh, in a year. So what, where am I skeptical? I don't think the lemons problems are essential when you talk about non-tradable assets such as SME loans. With non-tradable assets such as SME loans, it's a question of being patient enough to decide what's the best way of disposing of them. And in the case of the American SNLs, it took some 10 years. The payoff in the end was bigger than had been expected as of 1990 but the loss to taxpayers was st still quite substantial. And therefore, I don't think that having uh, large markets makes that much of a difference. In terms of assets, it makes an enormous difference whether you're talking about tradable or non-tradable assets. The one successful and very successful case of an asset management company was that for UBS, and about 80% of that portfolio was tradable and was affected by the very temporary breakdown of markets in, at the peak of the financial crisis. So after the re recovery, everything else recovered. With the S&Ls I just mentioned, it was uh, loans and it took a long time. I think the same is true for Ireland and Spain, and will be true for Italy and uh, Greece. 
We should think of time horizons of 10 to, to 20 years in this context. Uh, and we should also uh, see that the main purpose of such a carve-out would be take away the pressure and allow for a wait-and-see policy. But there are issues about distortions in recognition, distortions in uh, trying to figure out what's the size of the problem. And this gets us to the issue of valuations and there the interdependence with state aid. Real economic value, I submit, is not well defined if there is no market. But it's very much a question of assessments of what's the best we can do, do with this. Ask yourselves, what's the real val economic value of a lottery ticket that you go out and buy after you leave this event? <laughs> Tonight, do you put it into your balance sheet at cost, at expected value, at the amount that you expect to receive because you're sure you'll win? I'm sure you can find an accountant who will support each one of these three options. Now, the thing that really matters here is governance and who is the residual claimant. It's also a distinction between a bad bank approach and a good bank approach. The US, the FDIC, and the Swedes in 92 uh, used a good bank approach, where the point about the good bank approach is you have the government step in, carry the thing on, and after a while, reprivatize the good parts of the bank. See what you get. And at that point, you do the reckoning, and the claimants get whatever uh, they would get under the rules. So you don't determine beforehand who gets what which means that the valuation issue at the time of the transfer is irrelevant. The bad bank approach, which has been followed by Germany, by Spain, and many others, uh, makes this valuation issue central. In some cases, it just works intentionally as a way to hide public subsidies. Even in cases where it's not intentional, if you look at the numbers for the Spanish bad bank, uh, I think they did a very serious job of trying to assess what the stuff was worth. Still, two years later, they had to take a write-off of some two billion, an additional write-off of, of some, some two, two billion. The reason is that with loans, you cannot really see uh, where all uh, this is going, and therefore I am skepti skeptical about uh, the possibility to uh, do proper valuations. The only way to reduce the risk to the taxpayers is to delay the accounting until later on. Uh, attempts to delay, attempts to preserve the bank, by not taking control and to avoid the consolidation of the sector, I think, are dangerous. And that really has been the main cost of developments over the past few years. Just think about how much could the Italian government and the uh, owners of Atlanta have saved if the authorities had stepped in at the moment where the institutional investors in subordinated bank debt withdrew and were replaced by retail investors. That's the sort of delay that we have to avoid. But of course, the uh, political resistance uh, against that, the desire, the, the tendency to kick the can down the road, uh, prevents that leads to these delays, and that makes then the dealing with non-performing loans so difficult and resolution so controversial. 
Thank you very much, Martin. Can I ask you, uh, uh, what kind of institutional factors would, in your view, prevent this delay? Would the insolvency, for example, be one way of doing that? Are there other things? I mean, you know, would the insolvency there be the way to do it? What? Would insolvency be the way to do it? I mean, what, what kind of things would help us avoid these unnecessary delays? There are two, two levels to what you're saying. Three aspects to your question. One, uh, I definitely think that having the authorities step in and impose resolution in cases where banks don't recapitalize voluntarily would be useful. The other, what's the relation between resolution and insolvency, which then adds the issue of uh, Europe versus member states, where, which I think is uh, unhealthy uh, as we've just seen in the case of the Venetian banks. The third one, and here I share some of the skepticism uh, about state aid. State aid rules that we have are a way to impose some disciplines, this discipline that prevents member state governments from just outright uh, bailing out of everybody. But state aid rules are not attuned to dealing with problems of financial stability. The main objective of state aid control is the preservation of competition, which means that in some cases, the state aid measures can be too tough. They are too tough in cases where so if a proportionality principle means that you try to limit the amount of funds that are uh, injected, which then can just mean that the risk is going to appear next year again. In other ca cases, there may be too loose, such as you allow for bail-ins, in case uh, bailouts in cases of banks that leave the system uh, because it's no longer a threat to competition without thinking about the competition effects of investors expecting the government to provide such bailouts and liquidation. So uh, the, the answer is, in principle, yes, we need a combination of resolution and insolvency, but we also need to think about how we shape them and how we change the current institutions and the current rules on them. Uh, Giacomo Giorgio, do you have any quick thoughts uh, for what we've heard so far? And, uh, or Jack, go, go, ahead, ahead. go ahead. No, just I think uh, I thank you very. I think we heard. It, I mean, we certainly we have a very balanced panel uh, with uh, uh, different proposals and different view on the issue. Uh, my feeling is uh, that. Uh, uh, the skeptic, Martin's skepticism is not exceedingly skeptical in the sense that uh, I think that uh, in, in your discussion there are also several proposals on how to essentially design well these mechanisms. Uh, how, for example, to make sure that banks uh, uh, keep their skin uh, in the game, uh, the question of timing, how long this vehicles could possibly be. I think there is a lot of design, suggestion on design and fine-tuning that could make, could turn your skepticism in more optimism. That's my feeling. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe we should well, then we discuss, discuss it later. But then maybe so. you can comment from uh, Emilio, so you want to suggest something and then we'll go First of all, I, I, uh, I thank very much uh, Martin for his comment. Of course, he has the privilege of being one of um, the very few economists in the world who are both uh, general equilibrium and um, and uh, institutional economists. As a matter of fact, I I was eyewitness when he was asked by somebody to replace deposits with bananas and explain liquidity at <laughs> seminar in Edinburgh a few years ago. Um, so um, obviously. Um, having more equity is the solution to all problems, but how? And um, if investors are not rushing to invest to banks that they regard as uh, quasi-bankrupt, uh, and obviously, you know, 
you need to work around the current uh, legal framework. Uh, it's not a blue sky proposal, ours at least. Um, recapitalization under the BRD means billions, means a series of billions. There is an open bank, there is an open bank process in the BRD, so the bank can be uh, bailed in, the bank creditors can be bailed in while the bank is a going concern. A resolution in Europe doesn't mean going concern as it means in, uh, in the United States. So um, should we recapitalize them by bailing in all subordinate uh, creditors in Europe? Question mark. Um, a good bank, indeed, but what's the loss? Who is going to invest when the loss and the profit will appear in the future? And it's already seven years, if not nine, since the crisis. Taking a long-term approach and not mark them to uh, market, fully agreed, but then how do you hold stress tests? Nobody will know for a very long time whether they are solvent or insolvent, and what's the point of stress tests? I don't say that stress tests are the most credible way to do them because of the assumptions, the methodology. If you look at the Acharya papers, uh, if you look at EBA stress tests, most European banks are in robust health. If you look at the Acharya papers, most European banks are uh, for the graveyard. So, yeah, but um, are we going to accept the stress tests are a good indication of bank solvency or not? So within the institutional framework that uh, we are working with, um, and if we don't want to push everything to the ESM, but only a residual loss, I fear a combination of what Martin says and what we propo propose is the, uh, is the only solution for the time being to the exclusion of most alternatives. A very quick comment. Yes, we fully agree with the idea that uh, state aid has been designed for different purposes for competition policy. And uh, we, we have the impression that we are, we are mixing the different grounds and uh, using for, for a very important but different issue, which is the, uh, you know, stability in the system. And another point I want to mention is just uh, in the, uh, when, how do we measure uh, state aid currently for a transfer, uh, the difference between uh, the transfer price and what we call the market price. What is the market price? We don't have a market price. It's just a bid price which is not market price. So this really uh, tells you the difficulty of dealing with this yes. issue. Well, first, uh, let me thank the um, journal, European Economy, and uh, Bruegel for the invitation. And uh, uh, well, thank my colleagues for this uh, very interesting uh, um, well, presentations. Uh, I, I'm not going to, well, I'm in favor of an AMC, I should say, from the beginning. So I will just try to add some arguments if uh, I can convince uh, Martin, among others. Uh, well, okay, we, Bailin, which is in BRRD, which is, you know, the beginning of, of uh, some of the problems we, we face with the NPLs, uh, uh, can be very beneficial when we have uh, uh, an idiosyncratic bank-specific crisis. There, bail-in can be amazingly powerful. But if we have a systemic crisis, like the one we have in Greece, for instance, that I know very well, or in Italy, or other countries in, in Eurozone, then bail-in can create such an uncertainty which can lead to deposit uncertainty and can lead to deposit withdrawals, can lead to capital controls, and all that. So, and okay, I understand the argument that we shouldn't expect the taxpayer to carry the burden, but we have to remember that taxpayers at the same time are deposit holders. So they value uh, financial stability. So, uh, well, it's, uh, I don't want to pay, I mean, taxes for helping banks, huh? but on the other hand, I want my deposits to be safe at the bank. So uh, one has to, to try to, you know, to strike a balance there, if it is the taxpayers will or the deposit holders will, which are sometimes uh, interconnected. Uh, so NPLs in Europe, uh, in, in the Eurozone, is, are, are certainly uh, a very specific European Eurozone problem. It's, they are four times higher than NPLs in the US. 
So we must be doing something wrong. Uh, of course, I understand that in some countries, I mean, there is, there is a lot of uh, unequal uh, uh, distribution in some countries. We have some fragmented uh, banking market in some countries. They are much higher than in others. But anyway, let's, let's see what causes and why do we have NPLs? Why do we have so many NPLs in, in, in some countries? What's the cause of NPLs? So from all uh, empirical studies we have on the NPLs, we see that NPLs are caused by recession or low growth. They are caused by unemployment. Uh, they are caused by um, lack of uh, or reduction in disposable income and increasing taxes. They are caused by high interest rate margins. So, I mean, we have all these factors in some countries, which means that uh, on the one hand, we have the mountain of NPLs to, to resolve. On the other hand, we have to stop uh, new additions on this mountain. Because it doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, looking at the mountain, uh, there, is, there, is no, there are no more additions every, every quarter uh, added on this mountain. So uh, because the conditions are still there, because in some countries we still have low growth, we still have high unemployment, and this is in most, uh, uh, in a lot of, of uh, Eurozone countries, uh, disposable income has been reduced, taxes have been increased, which is another problem related to the fiscal problems of the countries. So, I mean, all this will continue adding to, uh, uh, well, NPLs. Uh, so, um, okay, uh, stocks of NPLs, uh, it's, uh, it's a mountain uh, now of NPLs. We have to, to see what we can do with it because on the one hand, uh, this creates problems for the banks to, to extend new credit to new businesses. So, uh, it's, it's a vicious circle. Uh, because of low growth, banks have MPL, so they do not provide new credit, so growth is lower. So this is a vicious uh, circle. Uh, and um, uh, so it's, um, we have this uh, stock of NPLs, and we say, what can we do with it? On the one hand, uh, we can uh, have a strict supervision, internal workout, uh, uh, strict uh, targets uh, by the SSM, uh, and uh, we, can, we can help reduce this mountain by, um, well, or part of this mountain by internal workout from the banks and external servicing. I mean, they, they, can, they can buy some services from external providers, the banks themselves. And on the other hand, we can ask for some kind of transfer on these assets to a third party. And this third party, we argue in this uh, uh, volume that uh, it's a good idea if it is an AMC. So um, internal workout, banks are trying, SSM is trying, providing targets and all that. Uh, the local central banks are also trying. But um, is it working? I can tell you that in Greece that, um, you know, we have, uh, I mean, capital banks are adequately capitalized in the sense that they have something like common equity tier one capital of, uh, you know, almost 17% on average, 15 to 17%. So still, uh, the default rate to the NPEs, non-performing exposures, is higher than the Q rate, i.e. what has been added to the non-performing exposures is 2.3%, was 2.3% last uh, quarter, and the Q rate, which is what is, has been taken out, was only 2%. So still, you see, you know, there is this, uh, the addition is, uh, is higher. Uh, so um, we cannot... Um, I mean, internal workout is good, but it's not fast, uh, it's difficult. Uh, I can tell you that in Greece, uh, I've been, I mean, according to the data of the central bank, 50% of the loans of the NPLs, which are restructured short term, uh, they rebound again. They are not performing again within a year. And uh, from those that have been long term restructured, Third, one third, more than 30%, become NPLs again within a year. So, you know, banks can work and try to restructure and all that, but it doesn't mean that if the general macroeconomic conditions are so uh, negative that things can, be, uh, can, can proceed smoothly. So in a sense, uh, I believe that uh, since the problem is so acute and it's uh, concentrated, uh, accumulated after all these years, it's, uh, as Emilio said, seven years in the crisis uh, now. 
uh, AMC could be could provide part of a, 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 a national AMC or a European, if possible, could provide part of a faster solution and could improve uh, things in the, in the banking market uh, in the Eurozone. Um, so, as we said, NPL transfers to a third party is difficult. Why? Because there, are, there is a difference. I mean, there are wide bid-ask price differences. And uh, so we have uh, to create a market where, and we have, I mean, if we have to have a market, there has to be transparency, reducing of information asymmetry, easing of market conditions, and AMC can help a lot uh, there. Um, I mean, an AMC seems to be much more drastic, uh, as experience shows from other countries and uh, uh, even other continents. So um, it's, um, uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, uh, of an AMC, the way things are now, uh, and especially if we refer to a systemic crisis as I see the crisis now in some countries at least, and as we have such an accumulation of the problem uh, in, in the last years. Um, so I think it's better if I stop here. I can, I, can I ask, I mean, on this systemic versus non systemic? So, I, I mean, are you saying that we should differentiate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and, and how shall we do that in the context of, of the Banking Union, the new laws that we have, so that we stay within the, the spirit of the yeah. law? Uh, but we do differentiate given actually that some countries have systemic NPL problems. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, systemic is when all banks face the same problem because of macroeconomic conditions. Mm -hmm. There, this is a systemic problem, for instance. While if you have one bank, because, because maybe I should have said in the beginning, NPLs are created on the one hand from uh, negative macroeconomic con conditions, on the other hand from bad management of the bank. So if it is macroeconomic conditions, usually they create a systemic problem of NPLs. If it is bad bank management, then you have an idiosyncratic problem. One bank may have uh, uh, problems. So there, of course, you can deal with bail-in and all that. You can ask for more capital. If the bank cannot find capital, you know, it's then you proceed with bail-in and all that. So you know, I, can see, I can see this difference. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason I believe AMC is, uh, is, could provide a faster uh, solution out of the problem is that we are still in most countries, in most Eurozone countries, in or at least the countries that have a serious uh, NPL problem, um, we are in a systemic problem until now. So. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let, before I give the, the floor to, 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 the, um, to our guests, uh, let me ask Laura to tell her views on, on well, some of the things we've, we've heard. Please. Thanks, and uh, first of all, thanks for having me on such a prestigious uh, panel here. I want to draw uh, perhaps a bit more attention to sort of the um, political feasibility question or the political economy of all this, right? Um, because it is very helpful and extremely important to talk of, about the technical details, but right now, currently, we're in a political situation, I guess, where um, it's not sure if this is bearing fruits, uh, given the constraints, the political constraints, right? So um, I do think that there are obvious economic, uh, there is an obvious economic rationale for having a, a resolution mechanism, even on the European level. Um, but I will get there um, a bit later. However, it doesn't appear to be a political priority um, for all of the necessary partners involved. So um, we're currently in a situation in the G20 where uncertainty about future um, international uh, regulatory regimes is extremely high. Uh, I do think that might actually be a boon uh, for Europe uh, because it forces us to reconsider and, and to um, take on the questions uh, that we can resolve on our own. Um, so that's good news. Uh, however, this takes um, working together from the European Council, the Commission, and the member states. And uh, that's something uh, I think uh, this was um, mentioned before, that it's not currently taking place the way it could or it should. Um, so despite the fact that NPLs are concentrated in, in particular countries, yet posing risks uh, beyond the national financial systems, and everyone knows that there, um, there's this possibility of spillovers, um, it's not, 
it's, it's uh, continuously running into a political stalemate. Um, and uh, I do think um, that my own government, the German government, uh, plays a particularly important role in this, and I will get there in a moment. Um, as I said, the, this issue uh, that was presented to us today of the European uh, economy on NPLs is tremendously helpful, and it's giving a comprehensive survey on everything um, uh, that could be possible. Um, and it's also giving us guidance on what should be done or should be avoided, uh, and um, pointing to particular risks. I mean, the whole question of clawback clauses were, was already mentioned, so it's very helpful there. It's giving very helpful um, uh, guidance for um, for sort of policy makers. But um, it, it also hints um, a bit later in the text, or always at the political feasibility problems. And um, here we are with the EU meter structure AMC, um, which is a very nice idea. Um, but it always comes down to the question of mutualization of risk. And as I already mentioned, uh, you have sort of the, the German um, veto player there that you need to somehow uh, find ways to convince, right? So what's the political economy um, uh, situation with establishing an, an MPL resolution mechanism? Um, you're pointing out three options, basically. Um, so either you have sort of uh, an MPL clearinghouse, which is setting common, common standards, which is already very important, but perhaps not enough. Um, or you have uh, national AMCs. Uh, with or without the option of securitization, which uh, again runs into the mutualization question at some point. And then you have the full-blown EU meter AMC, um, which you declare to be the, the sort of most efficient, but also politically least like the uh, option, right? Um, so let me at this point make um, some remarks or probing questions, um, perhaps getting you uh, to think about how to resolve existing V2 uh, points on your political agenda, right? So um, let me play the advocatus diaboli at this point. Um, uh, from a German perspective, German government perspective, perhaps, um, there's this remaining question, if NPL resolution, uh, after all, is without alternative, right? Um, or is there, as, as so often in the past, a way of muddling through, especially in a situation in which we are right now where growth is sort of coming back? Can we grow out of this problem? Or just uh, look to the side and wait until um, something happens in the, in the countries most affected without uh, German contribution to the resolution? Um, especially given the situation where Italy just received a green light on, on the MPS restructuring, isn't that already enough? Um, should more be done, or is this actually uh, sort of going to have negative impacts on, on um, European integration in the end? Um, a second question, it's, it's mentioned in, in, in the papers, and I think it is a very important point that MPL resolution is so dear to the small and medium uh, enterprises in Europe, which are the backbone of the European economy, as you point out. Um, but aren't there alternative uh, scenarios um, in which there's alternative financing? And we shouldn't even care so much about restructuring banks, but uh, perhaps think about um, other financing options becoming more prevalent, so sort of going down the, the American um, uh, way or the Chinese following, the, as I read, uh, more and more also the Chinese uh, way of financing, right? So um, a final probing question to you. With the AMCs, um, if you want to make it politically feasible, maybe is there a way of um, presenting it in a way that stresses things like sunset clauses, like limited uh, timing for certain instruments that, make this, that put emphasis on the fact that this is not going to be a long-term um, moral hazard problem, but there are solutions to uh, limit uh, the amount of losses and also the timing of such a new instrument like the AMC. And, and I leave it there. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I don't know if you have something to add to Jeff or Maya's answer on this, or anybody else in the panel? And then we should move to
I think, I mean, Chaltra has suggested that I wasn't all that skeptical. <laughs> he accused me of that, I believe. And I, I, I think the basic issue is really this. Who's control and who's financing? In 2012, at the height of the Spanish crisis, when Spain was, before Spain actually applied for ESM funding uh, for their banks, the Advisory Scientific Committee of the ESRB, uh, André was there, wrote a report, Forbearance Resolution and Deposit Insurance, which said basically, we can't afford to follow the Japanese strategy. Let's, by all means, socialize, mutualize legacy problems, and at the same time, set up the institutional structure for a cleanup that makes sure that uh, these things will not recur in the future. So, um, Discussions about the Spanish crisis led to the introduction of banking union, which hopefully was supposed to provide for the cleanup. Now, in the Italian case, I see the Italian government not wanting to play by those rules. Basically, they don't want to Europeanize uh, the resolution of Monte de Pasqui uh, and the Venetian banks. I also see the proposal of Mr. Enria as a way to avoid resolution while Europeanizing the handling of legacy assets. And what I do think that there are good arguments for Europeanizing the handling of legacy assets I think that once you go that way, you also have to uh, talk about Europeanization of control, and that includes something like interventions, as you have them in a resolution scheme. Uh, that includes the shutting down of banks. So the real dissent is, do we want to go into a route where we allow member state governments to continue what they've done all along with financial repression over decades. I mean, let's uh, not fool ourselves about the, the legacy, the cultural legacy that we have there, while mutualizing the costs. Or do we want to go to a banking union in which we uh, mutualize not just the funding, but also the governance? That's where I think is is the, the, the real dissent. Okay, thank you very much. Well, with that, let's then open up the floor. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Pierre, let's co collect questions. Pierre first. Uh, can I have the mic? Okay, and two at the back, yeah. No, the that was very clear. Another mic? Ah, yeah, okay. So, uh, thank you. I'm Pierre Wunsch from the National Bank of Belgium, but also representative of Belgium at the SRB. I, I don't want to spoil the party, but I, I'm even more skeptical than, than Martin would be because the, the, the way I see it from the discussion on resolution is that today we, we disagree on everything. We disagree on legacy assets, but we also disagree on the buffers for the future. If we are discussing today uh, resolution plans for banks going forward, banks that don't have problems today, I mean, you have a uh, position saying 8%, sub subordinated 8% is a minimum because of the reference in BRD, and some others saying 8% is a maximum and shouldn't be subordinated. So we don't agree on the legacy, and we don't agree on mutualization. We don't agree on the buffers. So there isn't much we agree on. The only thing we agree on is for the big systemic banks because of TLAC. Because there actually the solution doesn't come from Europe. So I think we can you know, go around the table and come with hundreds of proposals 
uh, and we will arrive at the conclusion we don't agree and so nothing is going to take place. Or if we really believe that the problem is urgent, the first thing I think we need to uh, clarify is who is responsible for the problem. And personally, I think as long as you believe this is a European problem, you're not going to find a solution. You first have to declare that at least for the legacy, it's a national problem. Uh, and then we have, when you have declared it's a national problem, you indeed face the problem that the DRD has not foreseen a transition period. And so either you declare that you are going to have some kind of flexibility in the transition and basically some subsidiarity in saying, when you have losses, you don't know the amount of losses uh, and you know you have very sensitive political issues. It is a political problem, so you need for politicians to be in charge and ta take responsibility. And there, I would agree with those that say that the DRD is putting too much of a constraint without a transition period. So I would be in favor of some kind of, you know, putting the DRD under parentheses, which is basically what is taking place to do. Because I mean, the Commission is going to tell you that they've been following the rules and only by uh, the rules, and the Commission is not never going to say something else, obviously. But we know from the last four cases that the rules are becoming flexible because the, the, the issue is becoming urgent. Uh, many thanks, Heiko Hesse from the IMF and DG Ekfin. I have two questions. The first question is, um, yeah, based on your uh, AMC proposals, have you done sort of some bottom-up or top-down impact assessment in terms of what costs we're actually talking about for the banks to actually get from net book value to either real economic value, let alone market price, and the cost for the fiscal? Um, and my second question is, uh, how would you start actually look at these national AMC proposals, given the rules have become somewhat more stringent. So the question is whether Sareb uh, or uh, the, the sort of Irish AMC, whether uh, today you could have similar Eurostat classifications. Thank you. Yeah, Rana Münster, European Commission. Um, two, two or three small remarks. The first one, what Picking up your example, what can we learn from the fact that three European countries have functioning distressed asset management companies set up by the government, which is Slovenia, which is Spain with the Sareb that you just mentioned, and which is Ireland with NAMA, number one. Number two, on the long list of reasons for non-performing loans, there's one element that I miss, and this is the ownership of the bank. If the ownership of the bank is not just a listed company, but if it's a province, if it's like Monte de Paschi di Siena Foundation that is linked to a certain region, and if these owners think that not making profit, but somehow capitalizing uh, their constituents in the reason and helping SMEs instead of taking a closer look at their, the viability of the business model is a kind of a priority, couldn't this also add to the problem? When we, I think the Veneto banks could be used as an example, Monte de Paschi could be an example, if Unicredit would still an assembly of local savings banks, it might b have a similar issue. Look uh, which banks went bankrupt in Spain. It was not exactly the well-capitalized large uh, listed companies. Third remark, when I look at the slides that you have shown, there's only four countries that matter in Europe. Yeah? That's Portugal, this is Italy, this is Greece, and this is Cyprus, which was not mentioned here. There you have a really over-dimensional relative to the size of the banking uh, sector and the GDP of the country and the L ratio. So do we really need a European instrument to just address four countries? Um, I'm just asking, couldn't we think of another solution like just recapitalizing these banks, maybe with the help of the ESM, um, things like that? I'm, I'm just asking. Because we, 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 it would be very difficult, if I follow what uh, Mrs. von Daniel said, to bring in the other 24 or whatever, um, 18 countries in the Eurozone into the boat, um, if it's only an 18 to 4 issue that I see here. But maybe this is my question here to the panel. Thank you very much. For us, uh, you know, applying the, the new rules of Bank Union, in a more flexible way, as we are doing de facto, this is Pierre's comment, and, and is it, does it merit a real transition, or, or can we declare Bank Union dead if we were to do that? Um, who would like to respond first to some of the comments? Um, 
Giorgio. Okay. Ah, there's so many things on the table, and this is extremely interesting. Uh, one thing, I mean, there are many issues that we can discuss. I will pick only a few of them. Uh, Martin, I think I share totally your view about uh, the, the need to mutualize funding and governance. Okay. So as far as this becomes uh, a, a something, you know, any kind of type of resolution that we can talk about becomes something that is funded at the European level, also required uh, European governance, and that that is sure, and I think that is necessary. But uh, at the moment, it doesn't seem to me that there is much funding at the European level of uh, resolution procedures, nor of NPL pro programs. And maybe this is why also national governments uh, are more reluctant to let it go, because they would, uh, well, unless they accept, of course, the ESM intervention, but there is no other way of essentially refinancing banks uh, either the, through the ESM, and even in this case, it's very complicated and very difficult. I think in the Italian case, uh, I think partly you might be right that there was uh, an intention of not losing control on the, on the management of the crisis and transfer control of the banks to the European authorities. But I think also it was very complicated to essentially end up managing those crises within the European rule. And maybe the Italian test was one of the first tests on how these European rules were functioning, because uh, Italy was the first country that had probably, because it had not dealt with its legacy assets before, but it was certainly the first country that had to deal with its bank with once the, the BRRD had been implemented. And actually, I think it became extremely difficult also for the reasons that you mentioned, because at the European level, there was a strong, it was difficult to define a coherent framework between institutions that some, on the one hand, were looking at the financial stability issue, of course, and on the other hand, were looking at a uh, preserving competition issue, what you had mentioned before. I think there was sometimes, to, there was maybe a conflict of objectives, uh, that might have created some uncertainty in the regulatory framework and might have made the regulation more complicated. So in that sense, I think that the political dimension, you're right, it's important, I agree, financing and governance should go together, but financing, there should be one. And uh, on the other hand, I think that the management of the crisis is difficult, was difficult within the European framework. So that was, I think, a crucial issue we have to think about. Uh, one last thing that I want to say, uh, among the many others that we are discussing, is that I wonder whether the NPL issue has all only to be dealt within a resolution or a BRRD framework, in the sense that this is an issue that Giacomo raised before, that many NPLs are in the, uh, on, on the balance sheets of banks, which are relatively healthy. Uh, and for these banks, you have the same issue of market failure that uh, you have for banks which are in need of resolution. So there is also an issue whether we should uh, really think about how to manage non-performing loans for banks that are essentially healthy, that do not need, uh, you know, uh, that they, they, they are, which would be not undercapitalized if they were to relinquish they or to dispose of their non-performing loans. I think this is a very important issue because if we accept that there is a uh, market failure there and if the market price is really not the real value, the real price of these assets, maybe uh, we have to think about something on how to sort out these market failures and whether, you know, these AMCs may be a solution also in this case. Okay, thank you. Giacomo, did you want to? Um, yes, very short, a uh, few points. Uh, uh, I think there is somehow a consensus emerging in the room. Uh, uh, on priorities, certainly ownership of the bank is a priority, of banks is a priority, uh, dealing with this uh, issue uh, is a priority. And uh, I, I think uh, even if um, um, MPLs are somehow concentrated in some of uh, relatively few numbers of countries, few, uh, uh, a small number of countries, uh, still the heterogeneity across countries and the heterogeneity within countries is showing that uh, even if uh, the size of uh, MPLs in the country is not large, there may be banks for um, 
uh, for whom those uh, MPLs are quite significant, also in countries where uh, MPLs are, as, as a country, as not are as important. And uh, um, I think another point on which we may in the end agree is precisely with, uh, about the transition period of BRD, which I think uh, it would be interesting to see whether uh, what's the consen whether there is a consensus in this room, but uh, certainly uh, that has been a political issue uh, which is uh, dragging on now where actually are we, so. First, um, two comments and then uh, a few answers. Um, if, uh, on Helen Lewin's point about the macroeconomic impact on NPLs, there is an IMF paper on non-performing loans, determinants and impact on macroeconomic performance, near Klein 2013, tested several times later, several times afterwards, which provides a, a model um, that separates idiosyncratic and microeconomic causes for non-performing loans. On the point of TILAC and Emeril, yes, we agree in Europe. The rest of the world does not agree with us. TILAC is not Emeril. And as a matter of fact, Emeril is a much more relaxed concept than, uh, than TILAC. And uh, we do various things in Europe which make TILAC Another, uh, which make Emeril another anodyne um, capital requirement. Now, um, there are fundamental differences because we have a time lag. There are fundamental differences and only four countries because the, uh, the crisis, of course, started in the north and the north um, of Europe mounted very expensive bailouts and also um, the north of Europe uh, ripped the, uh, I would call it utility point premium, which is that the bailout gives you a financial stability premium that's not really measurable. I hope, Matthias, I'm not representing you. I'm not misrepresenting you. So you, uh, the North uh, uh, acting outside the uh, straight jacket of the BRD mounted very expensive uh, bailouts. And of course, um, it has ripped the financial stability premium of bailouts. The South has now to comply with the BRD, uh, even though the BRD was not built for going concern uh, banks. Uh, I think that's the most important issue. The most important issue is how to keep going concern banks that should remain going concern banks as going concern banks uh, in the absence of uh, Martin's equity investors who probably do not flock at the entrance. So um, debt mutualization would be a solution, but I'm not suggesting any such thing. The only thing that is in our proposal is that the residual losses will go through the precautionary uh, recapitalization uh, instrument of the ESM. We do not suggest any new European instrument. All we say is that all interested parties can centralize decision making in order to improve governance marketing and transparency uh, with no loss sharing. Now on um, the size of the subsidy and what's going to be the loss, NAMA has recovered around 56% uh, of face value. If NAMA has recovered around 56% uh, of face value and most European banking, uh, most of the European banking sector has taken provisions that net, ex, uh, net book value would put the loan at around 70%, or at least the Greek banks have done, the difference is not that massive. So what's going to be the size of the subsidy? Definitely much lower than uh, what would have been the size of the subsidy three or four or five years, uh, three or four or five years ago. Um, should we change the BRD and the uh, and uh, create a traditional a transitional provisions. Not at this point, because the BRD has already lost credibility with what's going, uh, with, uh, what's going on in Italy. It's much better if we think creatively outside the box within the institutional constraints that we already have. And of course, that's what we have proposed. I find it interesting to think of Spain as being part of Northern Europe. 
I mean, Spain did this mm -hmm. before the BIR meeting. Mm -hmm. And Spa Spain actually had a significant cleanup. Now, Spain also raises the question of why was Banco Popular handled differently from MPS or the Venetian banks? Order of magnitude of Banco Popular and MPS is pretty comparable. Now, if you look at the Venetian banks, the solution that was eventually found was pretty much the same as the solution for Banco Popular, uh, except for the bail-in conditions. So I don't really think that the problem uh, of the Italian banks can be attributed to the fact that the BRD does not permit a proper handling of such situations. Now, when you say there is not much funding of resolution at the European level, that's true, but that's largely a function of the European level being avoided. In principle, uh, there would be scope for doing so, and there is something like a single resolution fund. So uh, I, I don't think the causality goes that way. Uh, if I look at the comments from the heads of the regional governments in Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein earlier this year about the ENRIA proposal, they said, wonderful. We put all the shipping loans from HSH Nordbank into that uh, asset management company, and then it becomes a problem of the federal government. So, or maybe uh, the ESM. So, uh, when I'm complaining about the Italian government, I know that there are uh, just uh, the same problems uh, in my own country, and we have just the same attitudes. Which brings me to a response to uh, the gentleman in the back. It isn't just the ownership of banks, it's also the ownership of bank debt. And if the debt holders are sufficiently well connected, I mean, in the case of Hupo Real Estate, uh, the head of the Financial Market Stabilization Agency claimed we had to rescue them because the debt holders included the established churches, the public television stations, lots of municipalities, plus some pension systems. Uh, then I think one's getting to the real sort of systemic risk that underlies all this. Um, maybe two points then. Um, on the BRD, um, I'm not sure if it's entirely helpful to think of ways of circumventing an institution that's just been built, right? So in terms of thinking of uh, the political future of the European Union and its institutions, I do see the need for flexibility, but it comes at a cost, at a political cost as well, and I think you always have to think this through. Um, so you might have to go the hard way and try to convince people and, and find common solutions. That was my claim initially. I think in, in the long run this is probably the more viable way than always coming up with the next institution each time an existing one is not functioning the way we like it to. So. Um, uh, on bringing in healthy banks, I, I thought it was an interesting um, uh, use of language, actually, the healthy bank. I mean, think of uh, any kind of um, health care systems. No one would actually think about ways of excluding healthy people from a common health care system so, or giving them special treatment so they, they're not dragged down by the rest of these sick people around. So I think the whole concept of, sort of avoiding uh, um, certain types of banks or, or less affected banks and giving them special treatment is somehow not... Uh, commensurable with the idea of finding a, a solution for everyone. Okay, uh, well, let's, go, let's have a, a second round. So Matthias had something. Uh, can we pass the part, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Matthias uh, de Watripon. Um, I was a National Bank of Belgium until two months ago. Now I'm back at the University of Brussels. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating debate. I do share uh, some of the skepticism of, uh, of Martin and, and Pierre. Uh, this being said, I, I think in terms of uh, what's good and bad in, in BRD and so on, and 
how does it help or hurt uh, the system. I think what is bad with BRD right now is that we have this 8% bail-in requirement without having sufficient funds that are bail-inable in the banks uh, that would not endanger financial stability. Because I think principle number one of financial stability is uh, don't spread the pain, concentrate it on money that is stuck in the bank. So the way to do it is exist, it's called TLAC, and we should have done it that way with a proper building up of loss absorbency, uh, of non-dangerous loss absorbency, but uh, right now we don't have that. So I do think that indeed what we, what we need to do is first face the fact that the cleanup is urgent and will require some public money. So a kind of 8% rule holiday makes sense. But then the question is, what is the best way to uh, still minimize the amount of public money that will, uh, that will be needed? I think at this point, politically, it has to be national money. It's not possible to have European money, I think. Uh, but still, I do think the state aid guidelines are useful and uh, these things are needed, uh, but not the 8% rule. Then on the issue of building up uh, the loss absorbency, I think the situation is extremely worrisome because right now what Europe is doing is trying to undermine the increase of loss absorbency. We are already, and it's a shame, I think, that we are already the only jurisdiction in the EU in the world that is Basel III non-compliant. And moreover, uh, Europe, a number of European jurisdictions are fighting to prevent the finalization of the post-crisis reforms and so the uh, credibilization of internal models. Uh, again, it's not helping. And then you have a number of uh, uh, European institutions and of course banks that are trying to limit the credibility of MREL to reduce uh, the insistence on uh, subordination, and without subordination, MREL doesn't say anything. So all these things, I think, are, are, are really needed. Uh, and unfortunately, at this point, <laughs> we can be a bit pessimistic. For that, uh, there were two questions here. Uh, for, for, I have four questions here, I think, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Dennis Sheehan, and uh, my company operates a, a private uh, debt platform for trading debt. My question is, does the panel think the Irish experience to date with NAMA has been a success or a failure. I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of, I look at Slovenia, I look at Spain, it's not as, progress isn't far as far along. I look at NAMA and there's pretty, they've made substantial progress. Now is it good progress or bad progress? I don't know, I'm asking the question. Yes, uh, Costanza Bufalini, Unicron, is it on? Yes. Sorry, I wanted to respond to the critics about uh, banks and institutions trying to play down uh, the TLAC and, and, and the need for the banking sector to build up uh, loss-absorbing capacity, to which is clearly subordinated. I, d I don't think actually this is the case. Actually, the industry accepts the idea of loss-absorbing capacity that needs to be clearly subordinated. What we are just saying is that the time is running and we have had uh, the BRD, which set a complete uh, different uh, concept where loss absorbing capacity did not have to be subordinated. So what we are saying is that we need time. And given the fact also that institutions, and I can say in this case, institutions are holding back the approval of a much needed law in some countries, for example, in Italy, which has not uh, changed its insolvency role to, to allow bank uh, to issue subordinated debt. So this is even more worrisome. So I wouldn't say uh, it's it's the banks. Uh, sometimes it's also the institutions, and uh, so we need a, a, you know a fast adoption of uh, the the so-called uh, creditor uh, hierarchy changes, which uh, would allow banks to start issuing subordinated debt. And we do accept the idea that uh, banks have to hold enough uh, subordinated debt. Uh, hi, it's uh, uh, Alberto Pozzolo from uh, uh, European Economy. Um, I have the impression that uh, part of the debate we had so far goes back to an old article on uh, rules rather than discretion. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, if we hadn't uh, the legacy problem, uh, uh, it would be perfectly fine uh, to apply the rules uh, the way in which uh, they have been written. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the rules uh, can be, have been empowered uh, 
a bit earlier than we expected. Uh, and it seems to me that in Europe, for a number of reasons uh, uh, that we can analyze, that there are many reasons, uh, we are much later than elsewhere in the world uh, to tackle uh, the effects uh, of the crisis. Uh, uh, this has been true for monetary economics. Uh, it seems to be true also in the case uh, of uh, uh, tackling the problem of, uh, of, of banks. Then at this point, uh, if you fear that uh, the kind of rules that are going to be applied uh, are going to be too strict, uh, well, of course, the government uh, is going to be a bit fearsome of uh, leaving the power at the European level. The more so, the moment in which uh, the institutional setting that you have at the European level is not fully clear. I mean, it, it came from the panel that, uh, for example, uh, the role uh, of uh, the competition authority in Europe uh, was not fully matching uh, uh, the needs uh, of uh, financial stability. I mean, it is quite clear. And honestly, if you read uh, the piece in European economy that has been written uh, uh, by the people from uh, uh, DG Comp uh, on their personal uh, capacity, it is quite clear that uh, they want to have, they claim that they have a role in uh, uh, so resolving uh, banking problems. Now, the moment in which the rules are not clear at the European level, uh, and you fear that they're gonna be applied uh, in a way that is too strict, and you still have legacy problems, uh, then of course uh, it is not easy to give power out. Now my point is that uh, the issue becomes the fact that uh, the debate now seems to be very much concentrated on solving the problems now, and again, uh, we are not uh, tackling the issue of having good rules uh, the moment in which the, seg the legacy problem will be solved. And this brings me back with something that has already been said before. Final comments. So let's start first with uh, the authors and the, uh, the editors. Uh, your I'm just picking up uh, one question about the progress of uh, experience of AMC uh, as we saw. Uh, um, so our impression is that um, uh, those experiences were uh, successful but in a sense, they were simple because they were based on, uh, uh, you know, a, a limited set of assets that were uh, um, strictly defined in a sense. And uh, so what we are uh, talking about here is uh, seeing whether the idea it's, uh, can be exported to uh, another extent with the problem that Martin was mentioning before, that some assets are non-tradable, tradable, which means that you don't have a market price. And, you, and the very same idea of uh, real economic value, uh, it's uh, difficult to, to even to define. Uh, so um, so uh, in a nutshell, our view is that those experiences are successful. They're interesting, it, they are a starting point, but uh, they're, as they are, they cannot be seen as the solution of what the, the uh, entity of the issue we're talking about here. Okay, thank you. Helen, do you have some final thoughts uh, that you would like to ask? About the question on Ireland, I do think that, uh, uh, well, uh, NAMA in Ireland was um, a successful story at the end uh, because they managed to recover a decent percentage of the, of the asset uh, uh, value. And uh, in Spain, it seems also it has helped. And anyway, as, as my final uh, contribution, an AMC is not really a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all problems, but it's, uh, it's uh, an institution which could help uh, a faster solution out of the crisis, especially for some countries like, for instance, Greece or Italy that have very low growth and uh, high unemployment. So. Thank you very much. I fully agree with um, uh, Eleni about the um, usefulness of AMC. It's not a, a silver bullet. Also, Martin's point about um, uh, credible assets is a very important point. Otherwise, not only you don't have market value, but you don't have a long-term economic value. So these are parameters which can be taken into account. But on the other point of um, who is financing and who is controlling, totally agreed. But right now, you can see that you have a framework that wants to push 
control, and rightly so, to the European level. But there is no means of sharing the burden whatsoever, and I do not suggest that there should be, because possibly that would amount to a breach of the treaty, but therein lies the paradox, and within that paradox you have behaviors like, um, like Italy. And while the paradox remains and no other solution is identified, what you were going to see going forward, and the Greek banks will be subject to stress tests at some point in 2018, is even more divergence rather than the desired convergence. This has been a rather uh, gloomy um, afternoon, so I, I try, <laughs> try to come up with something positive. Um, and yeah, it is important to take care also of the negative sides of this. But um, I think much more discussion could, in the future at least, focus on developing markets. And, and you have some ideas in the report here already, and, and they should be um, stressed more. Or, um, you, you should amp amp put emphasis on it in your presentations, I think, because we really need to uh, think about who could be viable creditors to buy these restructured loans and um, think about market development. And, and the financial market as such is changing, so uh, there might be future options that we have to consider, and that's also um, giving us some um, sort of perspective on where things should be heading, really. Oh, gloomy. As you saw in the numbers at the front, I mean, this has been, in the past three years, there has been huge uh, reductions of NPLs. So, I mean, there is, there is movement in this respect, but the question is, uh, the, the problem now is a lot more concentrated, and, and you know, the, then the question arises, as Eleni said, should we differentiate in the way that we approach this, simply because now we have, in very specific cases, also the question from, uh, from the back. I think this is an important issue, but it's not all that gloomy in the sense of there has been progress, so there has been huge institutional progress, for sure, um, and, and the question is whether you know, we, can, we can move forward, but I think it's, it's not fair, in my view, to say that we haven't made progress. Uh, but, but you're right, I agree with you entirely. Two comments, one on legacy assets. There will always be legacy assets. And I think we should not stress too much the specialness of the current situation. In fact, the legacy assets that we're talking about are very heterogeneous. In some countries, it's leftovers from the US financial crisis. In uh, northern Germany, it's left, well, ongoing shipping crisis. In Italy, it's the overall problem of the recession, where the recession in some respects can be said to go back to at least the year 2000. Uh, in Greece, it's very much the interconnectedness uh, between banks and the sovereign, including the fact that a lot of uh, loans that were affected by the 2012 haircut were previously sold from northern banks to Greek banks. So we are talking about some very heterogeneous problems in the longer run. I think the most interesting question is, if you look at the Italian experience, some of the problem has to do with macro developments relating to changes in uh, comparative advantage in international trade, competition from the Chinese for certain uh, Italian uh, industries. To the extent that you have regional specialization you have a macro problem at the level of the region going along with NPLs for banks specializing there. I think to some extent the Venetian banks uh, have been hit by that. A long term, now that, that's something that can recur any time. And the question is, how, what governance and what rules, good rules, do we have for dealing with that? The other point is much shorter low growth, it isn't just the fact that low growth is caused by banking problems, but banking problems may be caused by low growth, for which the Italian case, uh, I think, is an example, in which case we have to ask the additional question, can we really deal with this by just uh, relieving banks of non-performing loans? 
Yeah, just, just I, I don't want, I, I really don't want to be gloomy either because I think that uh, here there is, uh, that the options that have been presented in the journal are viable options on how to set up a scheme that may help solving some of the problems. I think that uh, the real issue uh, is really whether we can conceive within the BRRD framework, between the state aid uh, uh, rules, of uh, some mechanism that can allow the state to provide support to banks in certain conditions, even when banks are still uh, going concern, as we were saying before, and they are not failing or likely to fail or in need of resolution. There may be situation in which this is necessary. Maybe the amount of money required in this situation might not be too much. There are certainly ways in which you can deal with moral hazard pro problems to avoid that this support may create moral hazard problems. And sometimes this funding may help the system were to work out and to keep going at a limited go cost for taxpayers. Sometimes uh, restricting the use of state funding in these concerns may end up generating much more need for taxpayer money in the future. Of course, and this may happen even if banks are adequately capitalized, they have enough uh, funds, and essentially we certainly have created those buffers of bailinable uh, liabilities which are certainly necessary and very important. And I think these schemes of AMC, which are not the silver bullet and they are not the only way of sorting out the NPL problems, there are many other tools that need to be used in conjunction of these, are an example of how maybe sometimes state funding can be used effectively. And it seems to me that there is also, also from the political ground, there is some consensus on some of the key features that these vehicles could have to make so that they could be politically viable. We don't need a mutualization of uh, risks, for example, but essentially a strong co coordination on how these vehicles can be designed in each country could be useful. Uh, there, is, uh, there are mechanisms in which uh, you can make these function as a good bank and not necessarily as a bad bank, for example, by having states and banks sharing the ownership of these vehicles. Uh, you, there are different ways in which probably we can find a solution and a viable solution. So I, I, I think it's important also to take away the reasoning on this from the resolution, the banking resolution, uh, the idea of that they should only be associated to banks in need of resolution. I think it's a broader issue, and I think it provides an interesting solution on some of the issues. So I want to be optimistic in the, on that ground. That's great, thank you. But I still think that the one thing, one message I take away is that there still is an issue of how do you apply a differentiated approach, given that problems are actually quite different, legacy or not, uh, and at the same time preserve the, the, the credibility of the system, of a new system of put in place for good reasons. And I think that is, if you like, the $1 million question and, and I suspect we will have more events on this to, to, as we progress on, uh, on this. But with that, and I, given the time, I, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming, for taking the trouble to come from various places and for being here today, for presenting the, uh, the special issue of MPLs. We will continue to work on this at Bruegel. We will produce a, our next work on this issue will be very much on exactly what Laura called, which is the development of secondary markets for this MPLs. We think this is now the next, the next part to this issue. We're hoping to have this paper ready uh, after the summer holidays. Uh, thank you all for coming. And with that, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists uh, for coming. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.